Let's Get Two presents Go, Go Astro! Go, Go Astros! A focus on H Town Hardball. And we are back here on Go, Go Astros uh, all together again. I'll be honest, I thought we would not be back this soon. I really thought no one would sign anything until after the CBA was finished. So here we are. Here we are. The world is full of wondrous surprises. Yeah, and so we're just here to talk about the uh, New York Yankees having signed just – wait, this just in. I thought it was a done deal. It looks like the Astros have signed Justin Verlander. Uh, Brian, first impressions. Uh, apparently, you can't believe everything you read on Twitter, and uh, Jay Kaplan's advice to you, uh, James, may uh, still be a still apply. We should all spend less time on Twitter. Uh, second act. Mm-hmm. The more sort of serious analysis here. Um, the Astros are in a very interesting position this offseason when it comes to the rotation. They had six starters returning, each of whom are, you know, as we said, twos and threes, a lot of them. Um, so they didn't necessarily have a need for a starting pitcher. What they did have a need for is someone to pitch game one of the American League Division Series next year. And so um, they've had a, you know, they seem to have a philosophy that they don't want to give out long term contracts. More than five years seems to be their limit. But they're willing to spend money and they're willing to go up. They went over the uh, luxury tax threshold one year. They were really close to it the last couple of years. I expect they'll be a little below on payroll this year, but they'll still be close to it. So, you know, it was clear to see they may target one of the older starting pitchers who could sign a high dollar uh, short term deal. Um, And who better to sign it with than Jim Crane's golf buddy? Uh, is that what it's for, Andy? Like, is it really, do you see them nursing him through the beginning of the season just to make sure he's healthy for the playoffs? Like, is that the luxury we have? I mean, and there's a lot to be determined, right? Because there's going to be a new pitching coach. And so there's going to be somewhat of a change to the routines, maybe not dramatic, but certainly you're still going to have innings concerns with guys uh, like Verlander, but also with Urquidy, who has never thrown more than 115 innings in a season. Uh, with Fromber, who is a little bit dicey, uh, LMJ is difficult to keep healthy. Um, you've got a bunch of guys outside of Luis Garcia who don't profile as 200 inning guys. Verlander does profile as a 200 inning guy probably next year, um, if he gets through this year healthy. So I think, you know, Nursing probably isn't the right term, but is he on more of a pitch limit than he's been in his past? Probably. Um, I still think at the end of the day, he's a competitor that's going to be really difficult to pull out of a game. Um, and, and, you know, if Dusty does have one thing to his credit, he does have a strong enough personality to get his point across. I don't think he's going to be bullied yeah. by just Verlander. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Dusty's going to get pushed around like and that will be Dave the nice thing I say about Dusty Baker today in regards to pitchers. <laughs> that's true uh brian what do you think we can expect i mean apparently the workout went great jim crane uh, and uh well james click was just effusive with praise over um how it went i mean what what do you what do we what do you think we're going to get out of out of jv yeah it's it's hard to know right because the you know the last time we saw him pitch he pitched that one uh you know pitch a quality start for us on opening day in 2020 and you know the world was our oyster and we were going to have this great you know he's going to make his uh his contract and well that you know didn't quite happen um and of course the time before that we saw him pitch a full season he won the Cy Young award the time before that he finished second and the Cy Young award should have won it won yeah should have won Blake Snell stole that award yeah he's the Zach Wheeler of 2018 and actually several years before that uh but anyway um so obviously it's a look it is a lot of uncertainty, right? Because he is coming off Tommy John surgery and he's entering his age 39 season. So we don't quite know where yet. And I don't expect 200 innings out of Justin Verlander um, because, be, because of that. And also because, again, the Astros can absorb it. And they have seven average to above average major league starting pitchers if you divide seven by 162 you get 23 starts from each of them if you get 23 starts from each of those seven starters i'd be very happy uh this season some i believe will go over that but again the big thing with furlander is getting the rust knocked off of him 
getting him back to the command that is sometimes an issue with guys coming off Tommy John, particularly early in there. Uh, when they get to the major, that's often the issue to sort of worry about. And to get him most ramped up so that he is pitching his best in August and September. And look, again, they signed him for October. You know, it's funny, Andy. Um, I feel like of all the competitors out there, Justin's the guy who probably can bounce back from this fast. Like he seems um, determined. He seems very analytical in his approach. He seems like he's very aware of what his body can and can't do and how to make it do those things. And, you know, his career was quote over when he had the core injury a few years ago and he bounced back from that. Um, I mean, what do you think? Are you bullish or are you not on him? I think there is a certain calculated gamble that the Astros made yesterday. And Justin Verlander, um, if you're going to place that kind of bet on anybody, I think Justin Verlander and Mike and Max Scherzer are the two guys out in the market that you would place that in, place that kind of bet on. Um, he's a guy, and this is where the show really gets divided between Brian and I, because Brian will approach us very analytically and tell you statistically why this is a good deal or a bad deal. And I'm going to tell you emotionally, Justin Verlander seems like the guy that doesn't have a lot of quit in him. And there's a lot of non quantifiable things that he brings to the table. And I think one of those is the ability to know his body well enough to know what he can do and can't do. Um, He's a guy who two years ago, prior to the injury was still getting faster, the longer he pitched in games. He was still bumping it up to 98, 99 when he knew he only had two batters left and he could let it go. Um, He's very smart in the way he approaches hitters and approaches lineups. And I think, you know, to use uh, old Kennard, he's a a student of the game. Um, So he does study film. He studies lineups. He's going to be somebody who relies on and offers advice to Martin Maldonado on how we're going to work this lineup the first, the second, and the third time through. And I think that's the thing he does, he will be able to do better than anybody we currently have on the roster, is pitch a third time through. Maybe not in April and May, but certainly June and July, if he stays healthy and continues to progress, that's what he brings to the table. Um, I saw somebody post a question about, um, I think it was one of your prior guests, Sarge, asking about what happens if he isn't what we expect him to be when we sign him. He's still going to be a guy that has the ability to eat innings if he can pitch. Um, and major league teams need that. So let's say he comes back and he's a 3.75 ERA guy. Well, great. He's Eovaldi. Eovaldi is considered an upper echelon pitcher in major league baseball in 2021 or 2022. So that's, that's the floor for him. Uh, there's nothing but upside, I think. Um, so I, I'm excited about it. And I think it solidifies a lot of things. I also think it brings a lot of opportunities for James Click with a surplus of starting pitchers. I know, you know, the common thought is let's hold Pat and see what happens, but you've got seven on the major league roster, seven on the 40 man. You also have Hunter Brown who is expected to make his debut at some point in 2022. Uh, And then you have the enigma that is Forrest Whitley. You also Um, have Peter Solomon who, I mean, you have, and Tyler Ivey. I yeah. mean, there's a number of starting candidates that deserve a shot or could be in line for a shot. So I, I think you open yourself up to not only trying to unload Jacob Rizzi's contract, which isn't that big a deal except for that next year option. Uh, but he said he makes eight and a five this year, uh, eight, eight and a half. I don't see that being a big deal to move. Um, but you might move somebody like Jose Arquiti, who is under club control who is a proven playoff performer, who doesn't profile to be much better than he is right now, doesn't throw super hard, but you might be able to get the twins to bite for a Brian Buxton um, to solidify center field without having to go to the free agent market. Brian, there's a lot to unpack there. Would you like to begin unpacking? Yes. Um, first, first with his accusation that you are all numbers and no heart, I believe is I what he said. all. <laughs> a lot. I I. Happy to take the accusation that I am the analytics guy, and that's <laughs> how I think about m- m- many things, um, many things. But what Andy's absolutely right on here on sort of the qualitative side of this is that if you're going to make a bet on a 39-year-old pitcher, a 39-year-old pitcher coming back from Tommy John surgery, that Justin Verlander 
has an outstanding work ethic and has always had that through his career, that he is an exceedingly intelligent pitcher, you know, that he is someone who, you know, has for many years, I mean, he did this when he was a 25 year old and was in his early stages, you could see how sort of smart a pitcher he was, how, you know, he's a great communicator. And I think that can only be helpful to the rest of a, you know, relatively young uh, pitching staff. There's a lot of reasons to say, if I'm going to take, you know, any 39-year-old pitcher is a risk, a 39-year-old coming out here to, off of Tommy John surgery is a risk. The qualitative stuff helps you sort of justify the risk even more. And I feel good about that. Um, I am, I would not, not like them to trade a pitcher. I think because you have, uh, you know, there's no such thing as too much starting pitching in baseball as a general rule. You have um, a number of young pitchers who may, you know, again, um, what you're, how many innings you're going to get out of Verlander is a big question. And it's not something that I think is a priority for them to get April or even July innings out of Verlander. It's getting him ramped up for uh, the postseason. Um, will you have minor to major injuries from a bunch of pitchers? Probably, but they did really, but they have the depth gives you great sort of they're going to put out an average or above average starting pitcher just about every game, and that's a big advantage. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely the way to go. I tend to, or not a way to go, a way to go. I tend to um, look at the log jam in the minors and think maybe a guy getting traded doesn't necessarily burn us a whole bunch. And I think um, particularly where if you do address, like Andy proposed, the center field position through trade, then you can now address the shortstop position at a higher level through free agency. So it's definitely a big chess match to play, particularly if you do believe. Look, I, I still believe in Forrest Whitley. Am I the only one? No, Jeff Lunau still believes in him. If only he had a job. I keep hoping the Mets are going to hire him so we could trade for him <laughs> to the Mets. Uh, let's go back to Verlander then, though. So the Astros were not the only team to take a um, flyer and throw a lot of money uh, for a one-year deal on a pitcher coming off of Tommy John. The Angels did it as well in our division with Thor, who I've always been a big fan of. And I had we talked, Andy, before about wouldn't that be yeah. great if the Astros could have made a deal for him a couple years ago before the Granky trade. Um, who do you think took the bigger risk there? We'll start with, uh, we'll start with Andy. Um, honestly, the angels, uh, because they tied up a fair amount of money, $21 million. And I, I hate this part of this conversation that we have all the time. $21 million in major league baseball parlance is not a lot of money. It's a middle tier salary for a starting pitcher of some record, some notoriety. Uh, he's not a $30 million a year guy. He's certainly not making what Verlander made last year or Zach Grinke made last year and a host of others. But uh, he's also not making $8 million where Jay Goderizzi is. He's solidly in the middle. And I think that's fine. So you're not risking a lot of money. You're certainly not risking a lot of time and blocking anybody. Not that that would be a concern in the Angels organization because there are no starting pitchers in that organization. <laughs> um, it, but that is to me, feels far more of a make-good deal for Syndergaard than it does for Verlander. I think Verlander has a path and he has a, a plan of action. I don't get that same sense from Syndergaard, and I never have. Now, I don't follow him as closely, certainly, as the Astros, but even Mets fans will tell you that they're always kind of, when he's on, he's great, but he could get a hangnail and disappear for the next five months, and nobody would be surprised. Um, and if you look at the Angels' history of acquisition, that also wouldn't be surprising if he pitches for a month and then you don't hear from him again. I think the Angels' risk is what can they get when they eventually deal him at the trade deadline? <laughs> Brian, did you want to follow up on that? Well, if he follows the Angels' history, they won't get anything because he'll be on the IL at the trade deadline and therefore have no value. That's there you uh, go. You know, but still but, get MVP uh, vote somehow. You know, I mean, possibly so. And you know, well, no, no, I think both Trout and Otani will split the MVP next year, oh. and the Angels will win seventy nine games. That's my uh, prediction walking into next season. Um, there is a there is a. So the nice thing, if Justin Verlander needs more time to come back or has to be gently 
you know, sort of gently returned, the Astros have the starting pitching to absorb that. And their incentives are, hey, let's get you right. And once you're right, we'll take that. But let's get you right. The Angels have a very different incentive system, which is they need to win as many games as possible, as soon as possible, one, to turn around the mojo of that franchise, and two, because they're desperate to get to the playoffs because they have, again, they have the two best individual talents in baseball and haven't been there in, you know, forever. Um, and so they're going to be peddled to the metal every game next year. It's part of why they're willing to go for Syndergaard here, but this is not necessarily in Syndergaard's incentives. Syndergaard signed a one-year contract. And the biggest reason he signed a one-year contract is he thinks he's going to make more money next year right. after having, and if he throws a hundred innings this year and has 15 starts and it's 15 starts where he's, you know, has a three ERA, that's great for Syndergaard. And that's okay for the angels. And the long-term, the sort of the long-term thing here too, is the angels have given up their second draft pick in the 2022 major league draft for a guy on a one-year contract. So the, you know, this is understandable, right? In the sense that the angels are a win now team. Apparently Otani has been making noises about, you know, I'd kind of yeah. like to win and I'm going to be a free agent in a couple of years. So I kind of like to win hint, hint, hint. Um, doesn't seem to be as, you know, anyway, so the Angels have an incentive system to pitch Syndergaard as much as possible to get as much value out of it as they can. And will they break them? There's more risk of that with the Angels than almost any other franchise. Of course, that's probably why they went to 21 million rather than the 18.4. He had the offer on the qualifying offer. And he brings up a good point, though. I mean, the Astros really can, with the way the schedule lines up and you have all those days off at the beginning of the year like normal, you could do things like six-man rotation and you could do things like extra rest days for, for Justin Verlander. The Angels have no one behind Syndergaard. He's going to have to go out and, for in their mind, to wink the playoffs. So he, they're gonna, he's going to have to go out and be an ace right away. Yeah, um, and not that we want to turn into uh, go-go angels here, but Otani is an interesting case too because last year was the first year he stayed healthy for a full major league season. Um, so he was able to pitch and hit the entire year and did really well, got better from a pitching standpoint as he went along, but you've got your top two starters now that are giant injury risks if you're the angels because Syndergaard hasn't been able to stay healthy most of his career there have been a number of shutdown seasons if you go look at you know we, we we talk about Carlos Correa not staying healthy prior to last year and that being a big concern Syndergaard's in the same boat from that perspective uh, Otani has that kind of history as well although I think you know have a better feeling about him than I do about Syndergaard um, but yeah the Astros have a lot more flexibility and to Brian's point one of the reasons you don't trade a starter one of your seven or nine depending on how you want to count them is because you do have the luxury of working people back. Now, I don't think a six-man rotation is going to work long-term in Major League Baseball after the CBA because Universal DH is going to rob a roster spot. Doesn't affect the American League as much as it's going to affect the National League. But as your starting pitchers continue to profile with max velocity but fewer innings pitched, you've got to carry more bullpen pitchers. Um, so there's a trade-off there, right? So it becomes which of your which of these excess starting pitchers that you have that really have no place in triple a, do you have a slot for in your bullpen? So does Arquiti potentially profile as a bullpen guy next year? Maybe um, because Odorizzi probably doesn't, but you're probably keeping him on the roster unless you're just willing to eat that salary. If you don't deal him, um, Garcia has options, but what does he have to prove in triple a? I mean, there's a lot of moving parts there. I think you have to move a guy simply to remove some of the log jam and not two, not two pitchers, but, you know, turn it around. But if the Astros just go pitching crazy and our partner Keedy and Hunter Brown for Chris Bassett to the A's who are actively, you know, trying to sell him right now, I'd take that deal. And then you still have holes in center field and shortstop, but your starting pitching got leagues better really quickly. Well, and I also think too what we saw out of Oda Rizzi oh, at the end of the us, season. Give us Tony Kemp. I'm sorry, they give us Tony Kemp to man center field for a while until uh, Myers gets healthy. Kemp ain't easy. Uh, I I just uh, 
I also am not really so I'm not I'm not really to give up on Odorizzi either. I think what we saw at the end of the season and in the playoffs outside of the famous I didn't get enough time to warm up, he was lights out and was the pitcher we thought we'd get. Right. And, and at eight point five million dollars, he's a bargain. So that's you've got a lot of moving parts uh, and it becomes a balancing act for the Astros. Uh, who do you, who can you afford to have in AAA? Who needs to continue to develop? Well, that's obviously Brown and, and Whitley right now. Um, and I would say uh, El Reptil also needs to be in AAA as a starter exclusively, even at the expense of the Astros bullpen, um, because he is a major league starter. We are not doing him the service or right. not doing the service to our franchise by not letting him be a major league starter. Um, it's just, it, you've got a lot of moving parts that are going to cause some flexibility by necessity. You're going to have to get flexible. Um, I still think the Astros have a lot of unanswered questions too. Um, do you go re-sign Graveman? I hope so. Um, I hope they're investing money in Graveman and re-signing him for two or three more years. Um, what are you doing at shortstop? If you believe in Jeremy Pena, great, but is he ready next year with, what did he have? hundred at bats in triple a last year not even that yeah i don't think he's ready um so i guess here's my big question then um how are we filling center field and how are we fit how are we filling shortstop brian i mean do you think those are going to be free agent guys do you think what do you what do you think is going to happen yeah i mean i think between jake myers and Chaz mccormick in particular the defensibility you feel you have a you know average major league center fielder and so if you're going to get a center fielder, it's going to be, I don't know that the twin, I mean, I, you know, I don't know that the twins are going to trade Buxton, but i certainly think they're going to listen for offers. I don't think they're going to, if they trade him, that means they're rebuilding. I don't think they're going to take your kitty for him, but that's a different conversation. Uh, Ramon Laureano is obviously the other possibility we've talked about would be available, but my guess is they probably keep things you know, status quo at center field, they're more likely to get some short-term uh, shortstop option um, and maybe one for a couple, maybe one for a couple of years. And, you know, one that they think they have a tradable contract when they decide that Jeremy Pena is ready to be the starter. That would be my sort of guess on where they go, or they get a little like a one-term, a one-year uh, real short-term option, maybe like an Andleton Simmons or a Jose Iglesias. Uh, we'll see what they do there. But I do think they will spend money on the bullpen. Uh, Andy's brought up Kendall Graven, and they could re-sign him. A, uh, another excellent reliever who's on the free agent market is uh, Colin McHugh. And uh, I would have him, uh, I have him targeted above Graven on my personal free agent list, though. I want Ashley back in the fan base. I mean, among Ashley, the best Ashley, reasons, never, right? Ashley's there are two reasons Ashley, to get Ashley, Colin Ashley, McHugh. True. One, he's an excellent pitcher, and two, we get Ashley. Yeah, you're right, though. All our interactions with uh, Mrs. McHugh on uh, on Twitter would seem a little less weird. You're right, though, Andy. She never left. She got it got a little hard for her with the Braves series because she's an Atlanta girl. But it was yeah. it was tough. All right, guys, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks to check in right near the the end of the trade of the uh, the CBA. Uh, thanks for jumping on. I think we're excited that Verlander's back. I think at the first the first case, it was just a shot across the bow to some of the other teams who thought we weren't going to do anything. So uh, have a good Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for y'all. Andy, you wanted to add something? I think that is one of the interesting things. In all of the proposed places that Verlander was going to go, Houston was not mentioned once by any of the major no. media markets or beat reporters or anybody that covers Major League Baseball, which just goes to show you how out of touch um, most of the uh, – media world is when it comes to covering teams outside of the Northeast. I mean, what, what the latest thing was, we think it's going to be an East coast team because he lives in Florida and he wants. All right. Whatever. Good news. Good news. He got a floor. They were absolutely right. He got a Florida place to uh, go to spring training in. and technically speaking on a coast. So you're exactly right. That's two out of three. You, if you're doing you can't, 66 in Major League Baseball, you're a Hall of Famer. You, exactly. All right, guys. Well, you guys have a good Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you guys for, for being such a big part of the show. I can't wait to do a full season. Go Strohs. Go Strohs. Go Strohs.